The production process was the most time consuming process because it involved the scripting of each of the lectures, um, filming the lectures, editing the video, in incorporating sound to it, um, adding graphics and art to, to make it more engaging, visually appealing also. Um, it also included uploading the videos in, in YouTube for hosting and then ca captioning the, the videos so that students um, that um, couldn't hear uh, what was being said could read what was being said. And, um, and then the upload of those videos into the actual Murrieta, not the upload, but the linking. We would upload them to YouTube and then link them within the, the platform, the MOOC platform. We, uh, what you see here is the five videos per, per segment, let me see if I can. So each week had five videos, the intro, the three main subjects, and then the, the summary. And then it, it went like that for the four weeks. It was a total of 23 videos because we made an intro video um, and a closing video. And there might have been an, another video that at the moment I can't remember. Um, but a total uh, production was 23 videos. And the average time frame for each video was around three minutes. We operated uh, in a tight budget. What we wanted was to create a MOOC that was Harvard style in, in production, but at a, in a, at a budget, with a budget of a public university. So <laughs> it was quite the challenge. But uh, we managed it with a two-person team, the facilitator and the producer, and, and this um, list right here that you see. We used a single video camera aimed directly at the, at the um, facilitator, who the video camera was mounted on a tripod. On the tripod, we had a teleprompter, um, and the teleprompter had an iPad with an, a software application for a teleprompter. The camera was aimed directly at the professor. The professor had behind him a green screen, which was literally a piece of cloth that was green. <laughs> um, and with that, we recorded everything. In editing, we used um, Adobe Premiere for video editing, but um, we used the uh, educational discount on Adobe Premiere because it could be quite expensive, that software, uh, but it, there's, there's spe special pricing for um, universities. But you could also do the editing in um, free applications. It may work. Uh, you could try that. Um, we also use the Adobe Audition software for the editing of the audio. And then we, we did use uh, free stock photography um, from freedigitalphotos.net to um, animate the videos and uh, stock music. We had a, we purchased this, we purchased a CD with um, music, or we, we already had it. We had purchased it, so we had a license for it, but we used it for this book. That was the complete list of um, technological resources to to produce the the book. Um, what I want to do before I show you how it looked in the platform, um, let me see if there's an internet connection here. This is a YouTube channel that we created, and it um, it starts by playing the introduction video. That's the highest volume. But, um, you get the feel for what this is. It's quite simple. We replace the background. Um, with a white screen, um, we, we created the, the look of um, 
a, a TV or a plasma screen, and we animated that. Um, the, the professor in particular, really re he requested that uh, he didn't want to have too many things that distracted away from the message because the videos were short, and each, each word that he scripted was carefully scripted to, to convey a, 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 per, a particular message. So we tried to use the, the, the screen to highlight um, or, or support what he was saying, but not distract from it. So the design is quite simple or, or, or clean, but at least this, this video-based production gave some sort of instructor presence in a MOOC. Pero en nuestro caso, el camino sí es importante. Voy a hacer otra vez. So that was in Spanish. Um, so th that was the, the, the flavor of, of the MOOCs. This is how it looked in the actual Media Daikis platform. Um, <coughs> what, what you see here is the, the videos were embedded from YouTube directly into the platform. Um, there was a little um, a blurb summarizing what was being covered or what, what would be covered. There was the link to the script. So um, the captions were already in the video, but we provided um, a, a, a PDF document with the script. If people didn't want to use the video or they didn't have the bandwidth or they were offline, they could download the, the script. Um, the, each module appeared on the left-hand side or, or panel A, um, and it had the welcome module and then each of the other four modules. As you see, all of the components were here in, in order. The order was suggested, it wasn't required. We presented it in the, in the order that we thought students should, should go about their learning experience, but we didn't force it. Um, so once opened, the, the students could go in any part of the, of, of the system. Um, it had the survey, the five videos, the readings, the test, and then the assignment. Panel C over here was the social tools. We had forums um, that were linked in here. The, the PNR is the Q&A, is the uh, question and answer forum. And the wiki was um, something that participants asked in the first week. They said, can you share us more um, resources on the topic? So we created a wiki to um, contribute our resources and open it, open it to the entire um, community of MOOC participants for them to contribute to, to that. So the assembly phase involved configuring all of the elements within the platform, testing it and validating it. Um, the validation was done by the MOOC platform provider and um, once we complied with all of the required items or passed the validation period, they would open the course for registration. So the registration opened in uh, September of 2013. Um, it, it opened up, the course opened up in uh, October 30th for students to socialize, answer the initial demographic profile question survey, and, um, and share experiences, introduce each other to the other participants. And the official start date was November 4th. We planned the close date of December 1st because we allowed one week for each module. Um, but as a um, popular request, people were asking for more time to complete the assignments, we extended the course by, by another week. So we ended the MOOC in December um, 8th. 
Okay. These are the results. 2,339 um, students enrolled for the course when that registration period uh, opened. Um, and out of those, when the MOOC actually started, um, it had go oh, oh wait, sorry. It had gone down to 74%. Um, so out of those who enrolled, 74% actually started the course. And from the 74%, which was um, um, 1,700 students, 313 actually finished the course. That is a retention rate of 18%. Retention rates in MOOCs are uh, quite low. Uh, the average at the time was 6%, so we were way above the, um, the, the median back then. Um, and we, we did a couple of things to try to increase that um, retention period. But as I mentioned, in the, if, if you were in the, um, the winner's panel in the morning, Retention is not really a success measure in MOOCs um, because in the same way that MOOCs are open for enrollment, they are open for leaving. And the participants go in, they're curious, they try to see what the MOOC is all about or they satisfy a need and then they, they exit. And, and, and that's okay according to uh, satisfying learner needs. We had surveys um, in each of the modules, and what you see here is the percentage uh, response rates. The response rates are the um, number of students that responded divided by the, mo the number of students that actually started that module. So um, we, had, we started with a 91% response rate, and we ended up with a 70% response rate which is quite high for online surveys. Um, I think the, um, if, if, if it's not in the context of a MOOC, you could get as low as a 27% uh, response rate, um, according to the literature. We accessed at least 45 countries, um, mainly in Spain, Puerto Rico, Mexico, <coughs> Colombia, and Peru, but also as far as New Zealand, Japan, Morocco, and the Netherlands. So there were Hispanic students or Spanish-speaking people that, uh, in these countries that were interested in the subject matter and uh, participating in the MOOC. The majority of them, or slightly, slightly more than half, were female. Um, the median.